Namo myoho renge kyo. Hello, wonderful people. How are you? Thank you for being good friends and expanding this sangha, keeping this resource growing, not only here in these videos, the podcast, the, the threefoldlotus.com website, lots of free information there, and, um, and the bookstore, the, the e-books on Threefold Lotus. Um, what is this making? Okay. And, um, you know, the Mandala store, all of the resources that we can put together uh, to support our practice. Don't forget, um, we don't, I don't usually think about this, but uh, not only is it a, I mean, it's created, I created all of this resource to bolster our practice, to increase our confidence, to take away doubt, yeah, to keep our practice strong. But I also, uh, as a, a, another thought, think, well, it's also a teaching tool because uh, amongst us, we may have a friend or somebody who doesn't know anything about Buddhism, and there may be some particular document on threefoldrose.com um, or, or an ebook that you could send to them or a video you could share with them that might address some of the stumbling blocks, the questions they have, right? Um, a lot of the videos, of course, on this channel are pretty in-depth investigations into the writings of uh, Buddhism. But some of them are pretty introductory, uh, like under the playlist, um, How To, right? Um, there are a lot of videos there that aren't structured from goshos or sutras, but uh, simply explorations into terminology, ideas. Oh, uh, since I'm on the subject, can you tell that I don't script these videos? <laughs> uh, I said something yesterday, I think it was yesterday, <clears throat> sorry, about a new document I posted on threefoldlows.com called Self v. Environment. So you can go to the uh, core study materials page and you'll see a button in the middle there, Self v. Environment. Anyway, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's all like a PowerPoint, you know, Easy to understand, just read. It's not super technical or anything like that. It's just a, a recap of some of what I continue to, uh, to talk about with regards to what karma is, actually is. Um, and of course, I have an analogy. What do they call it? The, uh, the, the Kool-Aid analogy. I, I substituted cool for karma, the karma... Karma aid analogy, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah. Even Kool Aid is part of this formations to form, uh, to unformation cycle. Yeah. So you know there may be some. Uh, you can't put together something simplified without relying on some knowledge base, right? But hopefully, I've talked about this enough, and there's enough. Uh, in this document alone that will either answer questions for you or make you uh, perhaps come up with uh, more pointed questions uh, for answers, which will help everyone, right? So anyway, go look that up, and uh, you can use the comments or my email, tlksylvain at uh, gmail, and uh, let me know. All right, we're going to continue with our most recent Go Show, um, which I think is on the uh, the four uh, re rewards, what is it? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, the recitation of the expedient means in lifespan chapters. That's right. Our gongyo, basically. So here we go. But to return to your question, which uh, I will remind you, this woman basically wrote uh, Nietzsche in a letter asking him, you know, I used to recite the entire Lotus Sutra every day. And then uh, I really got some moments of inspiration in the Medicine King chapter. And I kind of started just reciting that every day. <clears throat> um, and so she's asking him, you know, how should I practice? What Am I doing something wrong? Am I doing something inadequate? Am I not thinking about this correctly? And so this is where Nietzsche came in with his description of the essential practice, uh, the complete practice, and the comprehensive practice, right? 
three different levels of practice. But the essential practice is the essential, right? So as I often say, uh, chanting Namo Myo Rengeko, the essential practice, sometimes doesn't, our samsaric mind doesn't feel fulfilled for some reason even though we're enlightening our Buddha nature. And I would posit that that's because we start getting rote about it. We forget that when we chant, we don't savor. Namu myoho renge kyo. You know, if, you're, if you've been part of one of those groups that just wants to chant as many times in a minute as possible, it's very easy to forget that what you're doing is immense. And I wouldn't recommend that kind of a practice to anyone because... That turns your practice into samsaric, what, a workout? What are you doing? You're enlivening your buddhanes. That's immense. Just considering with every character you sing and chant. <clears throat> the, the mechanism you're unfolding of the molecular constant instantiating moment to moment of potential, of life, moving through time space, right? Our measurement of that activity. If you consider that with every na, wow, mu, ah, get, I'm getting it, myo, that, um, the potential, ho, instantiating, renge, I perceive it, I see it, I'm witnessing it. Kyo, the teachings that lead me to this realization, right? If you think about all that as you're chanting, there's a far greater depth of connection with your buddhaness. But if all you're thinking is, I did 10 of them, and what are you doing, Right? It's like chanting for a Camaro. What? What? <laughs> it's so ridiculous when you think about it. And yet, that's samsara, right? That's very pleasing to our samsaric desires and cravings for ownership and more, more, more. But that's not buddhaness. That's not anywhere near buddhaness, right? So what Nietzsche is identifying is, though, at some point, you're going to struggle with staying resolved in your daimoku. And it's quite simple. Read a chapter, several chapters. Read the sutra. You will find inspiration in those stories. And if not, dive deeper. The more you combat your doubts with information the more resolved you are, the more you savor your practice, yeah? So, he's going to get back to that question again in this letter and says, as I said before, though no chapter of the Lotus Sutra is negligible, among the entire 28 chapters, the expedient means, the Hoben chapter, and the lifespan chapter, the Juryo chapter, are particularly outstanding. The remaining chapters are all, in a sense, the branches and leaves of these two chapters. Oh, so they're quite significant. They're not the only chapters. It doesn't delegitimize the rest of the Lotus Sutra. It just says, if you're going to shorthand your practice, obviously chant. And then additionally, to add confidence, to add depth of understanding to your chanting, chant the expedient means in life ten chapters of the Lotus Sutra. That's our gongil right there. Hmm? Therefore, for your regular recitation, I recommend that you practice reading the prose sections of the expedient means and the lifespan chapters. Now, does it did he really say the prose sections? 
We know, as I've said before, the way the sutras are structured, that his actual sermon was the prose section, because that's what's easily repeatable. Remember, it was the teachings were spread verbally. And the non-prose sections were really his ad hoc explanations to support the sermon, the prose section. It's all his teaching, but you, you follow what I'm saying, right? So, did Nitrin actually suggest that? Is that a denominational wish that got inserted into this translation? I don't know. But it's something to think about, something I consider every time I read these translations, right? I'm very aware of the politics in the world and in all these sectarian groups and individuals, right, on their own, imposing their interpretations, right? But certainly we can get out of all of this that Nietzsche was recommending these two chapters of the Lotus Sutra to expand her practice from simply chanting. Or if she's going to pick a chapter, though she picked the Medicine King, that's fine. But the two most significant, if she's going to shorthand it, would be the expedient means in a lifespan. Not an insignificant thing to point out, right? In addition, it might be well if you wrote out separate copies of these sections, right? Not just read them. But endeavor, you, you know when you write something down, it's a different form of remembering, knowing. Hmm? Do you do that? I, I used to do that all the time. I still do. I have to make lists for myself. And I may not bring the list with me, but the act of making the list, there's a visual connection in my brain that I can call upon later when I need it. So... That's what Shakyamuni said, read, recite, copy, spread this teaching. So Nitrin is just parroting Shakyamuni here, right? The remaining 26 chapters are like the shadow that follows one's body or the value inherent in a jewel. If you recite the lifespan and expedient mean chapters... Then the remaining chapters will naturally be included, even though you do not recite them. Right? This is always the provisional, the essential, the the support, the 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 meat. Right? Hmm? It is true that the Medicine King and the Devadatta chapters deal specifically with women's attainment of Buddhahood or rebirth in the Pure Land. Ah. So he sees why she might be attracted to those two chapters because they're about being a woman, and that's no small issue, especially in medieval Japan, right? But the Devadatta chapter is a branch and leaf of the expedient means chapter. And the Medicine King chapter is the branch and leaf of the expedient means and the lifespan chapters. Therefore, you should regularly recite these two chapters, the expedient means and the lifespan chapters. As for the remaining chapters, you may turn to them from time to time when you have a moment of leisure. You fit them in. But if you're going to make a core habit of practice, the second and sixteenth chapters, the expedient means and lifespan chapters, most important. And then if you want to hunt around and pick another chapter because you like it for some particular reason, feel free to, but fit that in when, you're, when time allows. Make your core these two with, of course, Daimoku. Also in your letter, you say that three times each day you bow in reverence to the seven chapters of the title, or the seven characters, sorry. The seven characters of the title. Are there seven characters in the title? Not unless you include Namu. Once again, Nietzsche is very specific, seven characters, or five. Right, the title Myo Ho Renge Kyo five, but he says the title here he's saying seven characters. Why? Because he's talking to a practitioner and he wants to make sure they include Na and Mu. Not six characters, not forty-eight characters. Na Mu Myo Ho Renge Kyo. He's very specific, consistently about this. Yeah. So anyone tells you different. Why are they disagreeing with who they say is their mentor, their teacher, right? 
Whose opinion is that? And that each day you repeat the words Namu Ichijo Myoten 10,000 times. Now, what is that? That's not Namu Myoten Gekyo. That's Namu something else. At times of menstruation, however, you refrain from reading the sutra. You ask if this is unseemly to bow in reverence to the seven characters or to recite Namu Ichijo Myoten without facing the Lotus Sutra, or if you should refrain from doing even that during your menstrual period. You also ask how many times a day following the end of your period you should wait before resuming recitation of the sutra. Now, we've talked about this before when I read this Gosho as part of the Nichiren's Gosho, right? But uh, women in, in the, well, even today, some women are raised with this what should I call it, stigma about their monthly menstruation, that this is a dirty thing. I've never understood that personally. To me, and maybe it's because I have a touch of autism, but to me, uh, menstruation is an amazing thing. You know, it's, first of all, it's quite a chore for a woman to have to deal with the cramps and the cleaning and the this and the that. So... You have my respect for having to deal with that on a monthly basis. But ladies, understand, and men, this is part of the reproductive cycle. This is part of what makes our species continue to be. This is what allows for new karmic streams of life to instantiate in human form to become enlightened and experience Buddha-ness. Surely, if you think of it in those terms, menstruation is a reminder of what an incredible process human life and its potential is. Right? For centuries, men have been very intimidated that women have that potential. Right? Men being the Apollonian creators, builders, see a uh, generally considered weak, pretty thing, the woman, to have this incredible godlike power. She makes people. That's super intimidating. But, you know, back off a minute. Instead of being intimidated, be awestruck, right? Appreciate that wonderful, fragile female with this potential, she must be protected. That should answer your Apollonian, right? Not owned, but protected, celebrated, revered even, as a function of myoho. What could be more immediate a physical reminder of myoho, potential manifesting. So, if it's got to clear itself out of old lining in the uterus because it wants to stay fresh for new life, certainly you could see how that should be celebrated, supported, appreciated. Hmm? But, Back in samurai days in medieval Japan, it was seen as such a dirty thing, such an unconscionable, right? What samurai would look at, upon that and go, ugh, what the hell is happening to you, right? It's a terrible way to look at it. But this is the environment women were brought up in. So they were taught that when you were going through menstruation, hide yourself. You, you, sometimes it's smelly. Right? And everybody knows. Right? They didn't have air conditioning and ventilation back then. So the women were encouraged, told to, ordered to, stay out of sight. Hide that crap. We don't want to deal with that. Same thing with very important practices. Like the Lotus Sutra. 
like practicing to the altars they would set up in their homes. Don't bring that to the altar. Stay away. Right? So she's asking Nitrin, what should I do? What's the proper way? Should I stay away for seven days? Should I wait? Blah, 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 blah. Right? A very pointed question from a woman to Nitrin. So, how does Nitrin answer? This is a matter that concerns all women and about which they always inquire. Of course. In past times, too, we find that many persons addressing themselves to this question concerning women. But because the sacred teachings put forward by Shakyamuni Buddha in the course of his lifetime do not touch upon this point, Shakyamuni didn't even bother to talk about that because that's samsaric. But let's see what Nietzsche says. No one has been able to offer any clear scriptural proof upon which to base an answer. Not clear because he didn't speak directly to it, but the clarity comes in a different form. So let's see what Nietzsche says. In my own study of the sacred teachings, though I find clear prohibition on certain days of the month against the impurity of things like meat or wine, the five spicy foods, or sexual acts, for instance, I've never come across any passage in the sutras or treatises that speaks of avoidances connected with menstruation. It's a natural human process. The others are about attachment and attitude and intent, right? And yet... While Shakyamuni Buddha was in the world, many women in their prime became nuns and devoted themselves to Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. But they were never shunned on account of their menstrual period. Judging from this, I would say that menstruation does not represent any kind of impurity coming from an external source. Right? It's not external. It's a natural function of the body. It is simply a characteristic of the female sex, a phenomenon related to the perpetuation of the seed of birth and death. Or in another sense, it might be regarded as a kind of chronically recurring illness. In the case of feces and urine, though these are substances produced by the body so long as one observes cleanly habits... There are no special prohibitions to be observed concerning them. Surely the same must be true of menstruation. That is why I think we hear of no particular rules for avoiding or avoidance pertaining to the subject in India or China. Japan, however, is the land of the gods. And it is the way of this country that although the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have manifested themselves here in the form of gods, strangely enough, in many cases, they do not confirm or conform to the sutras and treatises. Nevertheless, if one goes against them, one will incur actual punishment. So this is the societal problematic. Nothing in Buddhism has a problem with ladies' menstruation. It's just part of the human sexual procreation it's 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 part of samsara but it's not a there's no evil quote unquote in it it's not dirty any more than feces or urine is doesn't equate them as the same what he's saying is it's just functions of the body why should there be prohibitions that would be stupid it's like saying you know if, if um if you have 10 fingers you know you should cut one off because that's too many it just it would be silly right but societally, mm, you could incur illogical punishments simply because culture, right? When we scrutinize the sutras and treatises with care, we find that there is a teaching about a precept known as following the customs of the region. And that, and that corresponds to this. So this isn't about Buddhism, it's about local custom. 
The meaning of this precept is that so long as no seriously offensive act is involved, then even if one were to depart from, uh, to some slight degree from the teachings of Buddhism, it would be better to avoid going against the manners and customs of the country. So you could continue to practice Buddhism, right? Diplomacy. Be smart. This is a precept expounded by Shakyamuni Buddha. It appears that some wise men who are unaware of this point express extreme views, saying such things as because the gods are demon-like beings, they are unworthy of reverence, and that this has offended many lay supporters. Right? It's, it, people get carried away. But that's dangerous, right? If so... Since the gods of Japan have in most cases desired that prohibitions be observed during the period of menstruation, perhaps people born in this country should seriously observe such prohibitions. In other words, don't get caught going against this cultural norm. There's no problem with doing it if you want to do it when no one's around or whatever, but be sensitive to the others in your environment who might take offense, right? It's not offensive unless they take offense. Hmm? However, I do not think that such prohibitions should interfere with a woman's daily uh, devotions. I would guess that it is persons who never had any resolve in the Lotus Sutra to begin with who tell you otherwise. Oh, interesting. Because those who practice Lotus Sutra Buddhism... Lotus method, they, they quickly discard a lot of these societal norms, not without knowledge, though, being smart about it, common sense about it, right? They are trying to think of some way to make you stop reciting the sutra. But they do not feel that they can come right out and advise you to cast the sutra aside. So they'll make these excuses like, oh, you need to stay away from it, when you, blah, 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 blah. So they use the pretext of bodily impurity to try to distance you from it. They intimidate you by telling you that if you continue your regular devotions during a period of impurity, you'll be treating the sutra with disrespect. Not true. You're really disrespecting yourself. In this way, they mean to trick you into incurring an offense. I hope you will keep in mind all that I have said regarding this matter. On this basis, even if your menstrual period should last as long as seven days, if you feel so inclined, dispense with the reading of the sutra and simply recite Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Right? The essential. Keep your practice going at all times. And you can do that in your head. The more you can involve your body and mind, the better. But sometimes it's more appropriate to do it quietly by yourself. Don't stop your practice because you're menstruating, right? Also, when making your devotions, you need not bow facing the sutra. On the other hand, if suddenly you should feel, for example, the approach of death, then even if you're eating fish or fowl, if you're able to read the sutra, you should do so. And likewise, chant, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Needless to say, the same principle applies during your period of menstruation. Though reciting the words Namu Ichi Jo Myoten amounts to the same thing, it would be better if you just chanted Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. As Bodhisattva Vasubandhu and the great teacher Tendai did. Isn't that interesting? Put that in your memory bank. This is, people ask me from time to time, or they assume, because they're probably told this, that Namo Myoho Renge Kyo is something Nichiren invented. But did you hear what he just said? Vasubandhu. Yeah, Tendai, you might say, okay, that makes sense, because he was all about the Lotus Sutra. Tendai sect is based on the Lotus Sutra, and the title of the Lotus Sutra is Myoho Renge Kyo. So, of course... Tendai, I'm sure, chanted Namo Myo Renge Kyo. But Vasubandhu? Way back then? 
We're going back to Nagarjuna, Vasubandhu. Vasubandhu chanted, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Oh! There's nothing new about this. Hmm. That just, he just casually drops that in. There are specific reasons why I say this. Respectfully, Nitrin. So, that closes that letter out. Very interesting, and I hope you ladies were paying attention to that. Our next uh, go show on curing karmic disease. And boy, have I gotten some backlash from time to time about talking about this one. There's a lot of misunderstanding about what karmic disease is. But we'll leave that to next time. In the meantime, I hope you're taking care of your health. I hope you respect the processes of human beings, right? We understand that. I hope you understand that the core of our practice, the essential por portion of our practice, is to enliven our buddhaness. Namu myoho renge kyo. And right along with that, the flip side of that is, don't let it become a yawning habit. Don't, don't get disinvested with the amazement of it. That's a, a form of doubt. And the moment you feel that, then... Grab the Lotus Sutra, read a chapter, read a portion of it, read a go show, read, watch a video, download a document, read, you know, engage your mind in all the facets that this practice touches on and enlightens. And remind yourself again to savor your practice. Namu myoho renge kyo. Hmm? Savor each character. Namu myoho renge kyo. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you can. Uh, and they're helpful. Please uh, buy an ebook or purchase a print book. Get the correct mandala. Go to the threefoldlotus.com website. And download the, all the, there's tons of typical questions asked of a practitioner from karma to what is Namo Myorengeko, how does chanting work, blah, blah, blah. There's all kinds of uh, documents there explaining, like the 12 divisions. What the heck is the 12 divisions? Well, there's a button, there's a document. All of these things, you'll start to see how connected all these, what they seem like disparate concepts and so forth. They all have the same rhetoric pointing to one another, and it all comes together. It's really fascinating. Buddhism is amazing that way. So I encourage you, use as much of the free resources as there are, the podcasts, these videos, and uh, if you can, to help support the Sangha, to support this effort. Uh, yeah, purchases and uh, uh, there's, you know, Patreon and PayPal. So with much gratitude, thank you for being here. Keep your practice strong. And be mindful of your health, right? Be kind to yourself and, of course, others. And I'll see you in the next one. All right. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.